What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Jeff Crane of Kingstar Media. And Jeff, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes of the podcast people should check out. Um, Jeff and I both geek out on direct response marketing. I think it's really one of the foundations of, of everything. Um, and so I've had some of the top direct response marketers on the podcast. Um, I had You'd appreciate this, I think, Jeff, because you guys do advertising across TV, radio, programmatic, um, you know, online, TikTok, you name it. Uh, Ron Popeil. I don't know if you remember Ron Popeil, uh, the infomercial king. Um, he's unfortunately not with us anymore, but he shared some incredible stories about uh, his journey and um, just direct using direct response on in TV uh, to drive sales and. Um, just there's there's so many more. I had uh, Rick Cesari who worked behind some companies like GoPro and Juice Man Juicer and George Foreman Grill with, again, infomercials. And, and he shared some incredible insights with marketing and direct response. So check those out on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect their dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the full strategy, accountability, and execution for your podcast. You know, Jeff, we call ourselves the magic elves that work in the background to make it look easy for the host and the company so they could just run their business, create great content, and develop amazing relationships. Um, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us support at rise25.com. And I'm excited to introduce Jeff Crane um, and within Kingstar Media. They have an expertise in performance media, as I mentioned, buying across all advertising mediums, uh, TV, radio, yeah, they still still radio. People are listening to radio. People are still buying from radio, and also not just you know on you know you know the the normal radio, but online radio. You know, there's the Spotify's of the world, and the, you know, we're talking on a podcast right now. Um, and there's advertising on there, um, and programmatic, paid social, TikTok, you name it. Um, so check them out. They're Kingstar Media, and their agency started back in 2003. And Jeff, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Dr. Weiss. Great to be here. So talk about Kingstar Media and what you do a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. So like you mentioned, Kingstar was founded 20 years ago. It was originally built as a direct response production company. So back in the day when people used to overnight watch 30 minute infomercials, uh, they'd be stuck glued to the TV and then make that phone call to buy a juicer or a knife or a kitchen set. That's how the company was built. Uh, it really transformed into then a media buying company. So we would produce those shows. Then we're like, okay, why don't we just buy some media on TV to, to sell that production? And then it really morphed into short form, which at the time was two minute spot. We would consider a short form commercial. And then it transitioned now into what we're doing, which is some short as 15 seconds. That's really still a, a large part of our business is that traditional linear TV buying. Canada, the consumption habits, People are still very traditional and old school in their media habits here. People 70% still watch TV every day, 75% still listen to traditional radio every day. So we're still buying a lot of that. But every client we work with has some sort of KPI or performance objective, whether it's a cost per visit to the site, cost per lead, cost per sale. We're trying to buy media to acquire those users uh, or sales at uh, that target cost and target KPI. And we're doing it across, like I mentioned, linear TV and radio or connected TV, programmatic, paid social, paid search. It's really endless depending on the demo. Talk about you were just at a, a, a conference um, called the Future of TV. So what were some of the things that you brought back from that? 
Yeah, so it's very interesting. At the future of TV, all of the major broadcasters in Canada uh, here spoke. So, you know, it was Coors, Bell and Rogers, which in the US would be your Fox, CBS and ABC. So really these major players in the media space. And there was a lot of frustration because on the linear TV side, they're required by the government to provide a lot of data, uh, invest a lot of money into technology. They have third parties that verify their impressions and, and the data that they're reporting. Now they're playing in this connected TV space and a lot of these international players are cutting into their market share. Think of an international player like Samsung who has, you know, based internationally, really has no full presence here in Canada, but they're commanding a large portion of media budgets now for connected TV and streaming because they own, you know, 30, 40% of the TVs here in Canada and they're not sharing any data. So they're, you, you run a campaign with Samsung, they say they delivered 100,000 ad impressions. There's no third party body to measure or to confirm that that was actually delivered or that anybody was actually watching any of those impressions. So that, that was about a big part of the discussion was the future of TV and where does it go? How do we integrate that same kind of, but we don't call it restrictions, but governing bodies into connected TV when there's so many different players and so many of them are international? We'll talk about some examples. I know a lot of people listening, they may be in the B2B space and we're going to talk some through some specific examples on how you can and how Jeff got exposure, um, their company helped these companies get exposure uh, in the B2B space. But you cut your teeth, you know, in the agency world, you started working on big accounts like Johnson & Johnson and Coca-Cola. So I'm wondering what are some of the things you learned working with those companies and what did you do? Yeah, so, you know, it's a funny question. I was right out of school. It was my first job in university. I got placed on the digital team at this at this big uh, global agency, and my accounts were Coca Cola and Johnson and Johnson. At the time, the digital landscape was still the wild, wild west. I remember we would do a Facebook media buy. It was the same kind of thing as I was saying. We would just send a report and said we spent X amount of dollars, we delivered X amount of impressions, X amount of clicks, and there was never any oh feedback. How did it do? Any changes that you make? There was really no uh, kind of fine tooth comb being pulled over the report. They just wanted to be in the digital space. But what it's talking it was more of like a branding play as opposed to any actionable, some kind of action. Exactly, Dr. Roy. So and that's what it taught me was that these big brands, they're less concerned with the down funnel metric. Their pure goal is eyeballs, frequency, and reach. They just want to reach as many people as possible because they know that an X amount of people, regardless of the demographic, are going to buy their product. So it was really an eye opener to work with these massive brands as their objectives are so much different than some of these small and medium brands that I'm working with today. That is really interesting. And so as you, did you always know you wanted to be in the agency world? Yeah, so I think it's a good question. For me, it's a it's been a family business uh, and industry. You know, my father founded this company 20 years ago. He's you know the boss president of, of Kingstar. And growing up, he was a producer. He was doing these uh, infomercials and commercials, and I was kind of always involved. I would be on set with him, helping out. Uh, I kind of got exposed to advertising, marketing, and, and creative at an early age. So naturally, when I went to university, and was in business. Everybody does like, you know, their finance, their marketing, and they do these different uh, sections in, in their first couple of years. And I always did better in marketing. It was more, I guess, comfortable for me as it was something that I grew up with. So naturally out of school, I kind of was looking for jobs in advertising since I was comfortable in and understood. Uh, and I just kind of fell into it and I've been in it ever since. Did you think that you would go work for and with your dad? You know, I think I worked with him early in my career and then I was went away and I was like, oh, yes, this is so great to be working on my own. And I did build, you know, uh, I think what I think is a, a good name for myself and have a lot of confidence in the work that I actually did. But I think if I had worked for the family company right out of school, and that's all I did. I think it really would have been a detriment to my career uh, just because you don't really get the opportunity to learn new things. And when you work for somebody else, obviously, it's a lot a uh, little bit different of kind of over any reach. But I think a lot of people think that, oh, it's so easy to work for uh, a family company or, or for your parents. But you got to think of it like this. 
when you're working for your parents, everybody that you work with who's not part of the family is going to think that you get it easier than them, that you get a longer leash. When in fact, it's the complete opposite because you got to prove to them that you're not, you know, one of those kids that does nothing and produces nothing. But then you also got to show to your father that you're not being lazy and constantly producing. So, you know, it's a lot uh, more difficult than maybe people let on. Uh, and I think now coming back to the agency, obviously being able to take control of my own uh, silos within, which is a lot the digital team, which I run, manage and have grown from the ground up. It's really nice to kind of have my autonomy uh, and my ability to, to try to grow it as I wish. Because you did start, you worked for companies and you started your own company too. Yeah. Talk about entrepreneurship. Um, I mean, obviously your dad owns a company right now and, and I don't know what his plan is for succession, but but you are an entrepreneur there and talk about how um, maybe other agencies can cultivate that because um, that entrepreneurship Absolutely. In their own company. No, it's it's a, it's a great great point, and I think that you know, think back to Kingstar. They're a they were a production company. They were a TV company. They didn't really have any internal knowledge or expertise in the digital field. So I had come out after working kind of for myself or with other companies for close to ten years, and I brought that knowledge and things that I learned and, and helped grow. And I think that what Kingstar did well, uh, my father and, and the executive team there is they really gave me the opportunity and the trust to grow uh, and build my own thing. And they, I think, as you mentioned, what should other agencies do? They really have to just be realistic and, you know, no ego. This is what we do well. This is what we don't do well. If we want to expand into a, a new vertical or uh, become experts in a different field, we're going to go have to hire those experts because we don't have it. And I think uh, lowering that ego, giving somebody the trust and ability to build something on their own um, and not being too overbearing at the start is really important to, to foster that growth. Were you going, and maybe you felt comfortable, but more comfortable than most, but how did you approach them on, hey, I want to start this new division or service? Yeah, so it really was like I had been, as you mentioned, kind of had my own business for the years prior. And I said, OK, why don't I take these clients and we'll bring them on and say, why don't I do what I'm doing for them, for you? And you have so many amazing brands and currently you're only buying their traditional media. What if we were able to kind of cross sell and offer them other services uh, to help expand the revenue. And I think that's really, was really an easy sell. They just needed us, me and my team to get to the point where they were comfortable putting us on the call with some of these massive brands that have trusted them for years. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So um, if you're watching or listening, uh, you see we're at Kingstar Media website uh, here, um, dot com. And uh, I was just poking around here, yeah, obviously the different services you offer. And then the, this is kind of the digital piece that you've helped build out. Um, and let's talk about a B2B example. Um, there was a company you helped that does uh, employment, online yeah. employment. What did you do with them? Yeah. So they were a dig digitally native brand, uh, online employment uh, company where you can go look for jobs, et cetera. Their goal was to target employers who wanted to uh, be listed on their website and promote jobs that they're uh, within their company to hire people. So that was really that B2B play where our goal was to find those Canadian business owners that were looking to hire staff and were looking to list on this site. And for digitally native brands, they a lot of the time they built their company from Facebook, Google. They had that internal expertise. That's how they got to where they are. Someone on their staff, someone, one of their founders was very knowledgeable in the digital landscape. That's how they grew their company. Typically, that is the way. So a lot of the times we we'll work with these digitally native brands and we're not going to offer them paid social or paid search services because that's how they built their brand. What we're going to do is really offer them traditional media services. Digital media is an extremely competitive landscape, um, especially in the U.S. and Canada. There's a lot of advertisers competing for those same eyeballs. So naturally, CPMs are higher, costs are higher, and that pushes down the funnel to a really high cost per leader acquisition. Traditional television is still priced very well. There's still a large audience there. If your uh, commercial is in the middle of 
Ford and Coca-Cola, you're really promoting validity that, okay, this brand's legit, as opposed to you seeing them on your Instagram feed with someone selling socks or or pans that look sketchy from, from Alibaba. So it provides that legitimacy, it's affordable, and it drives response. We can measure the impact it has at the down funnel, and it also fuels growth in digital. Because think about it, let's say that a thousand people go to your website, only 10 people maybe buy the product. You got 990 people now that you can retarget on Facebook, retarget on Google that would have never came to your website unless they saw it on television. What should someone's budget look like if they want to, uh, and maybe there's a starting budget and obviously as they see it works. Uh, there's two questions and we'll ask, we could address them separately, but I'm wondering what a call to action, a good call to action would be on what you've seen people do. Cause again, you're not just about branding, right? Um, usually Coca-Cola commercial comes on. I'm not like, texting or trying to buy it right it's a branding yeah. thing so from a, a direct response standpoint i'm curious to call the action then i'm curious about the budget uh, maybe start with the the offer or the call to action on something yeah. like this great question like yeah you're not gonna see the coca-cola commercial and, and then jump on amazon and buy uh, a couple of cases you may but typically not so back in the day like pure direct response was call now and if you call in the next 30 seconds we're going to give you 20% off, or we're going to give you this free. Nobody really calls phones anymore. That is, you know, kind of a, a way that people used to. I would say back in the day, if, let's say 10 years ago, if we had a phone number on the spot, out of all the visits or orders for that day, 50% of them would have come to the phone. Now it's probably about 10%. Most people go to the website. Or if it's a product, they're going to go to Amazon. They have Amazon Prime. They're like, I know that if I don't like this product, it's going to be returned. I can get it shipped to me in one day. So the best CTA that we see is, you know, visit our website. People are adding a QR code now. Every Almost everybody's having these smart TVs where you can just pause the commercial, really? pause what you're watching. So if you can't capture it within that 30 seconds, you pause it, you can scan the QR code. So that would be one thing where, you know, someone would say, scan this unique QR code now. We're giving 10% off for the next 30 minutes. That would be a, a way that people are driving CTA. Otherwise, it's just your traditional, you know, available at Amazon or available on our website. That is a typical way. In terms of pricing now, what you're saying to get on TV. Real quick on that, Jeff. Yeah. Um the the call it is there um so do you is there some incentives that you see work, or is it more just like if if they're you know, this looks interesting to you and you qualify, um, are you finding like in that um I guess you could say the employment company, are they giving any type of incentives at all to take an action or? Yeah, great question. Typ typical incentives would be some sort of sale or deal that is limited time. So let's just say, you know, for, for the month of September, we are offering, uh, you know, 10% off for all employers who sign up and list their uh, jobs on our site. Um, that is typically a limited time or time limit would be the best incentive. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. So most people are going to the website and some kind of time limited offer. So it creates some type of urgency for them to take an action. Um, and so what about what should budget expectations be? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, if I need to get on TV, it's so expensive. I got to spend all this money on a commercial. It's going to cost me so much to buy the media. We uh, just as last week, and we've done it every single month, I would say uh, this year, we've had a new advertiser who's never been on TV before. And we have a production team. We can create a 30 second commercial that's uh, very high quality, ready for broadcast for under $20,000 Canadian. And for a US audience, that's like five bucks. I'm kidding, but <laughs> look at the conversion rate. It's very It's cheap. only $100 US. <laughs> <Yeah. No, I'm laughs> so 20,000 Canadian for the for the commercial. And then to test the media, we typically like to do either a two week test on TV or a four week test. And you can test with a $5,000 Canadian budget a week. So think about this. If you wanted to do a two week test and get on TV, you could get do it all for, you know, in the budget range of 30 grand. And that's Canadian. And you're going to really see a measure response. You're going to own all the creative. You're going to get on high profile channels. You're going to get in sporting events that you think, you know, football games, hockey games here, uh, baseball, you'll get in really premium content and you're going to put your brand up next to those heavy hitters like the GMs and Fords. Do you work with US-based companies? Also? I would say 
uh, Dr. Weiss, that 50% of our clients are uh, U.S. Um, I would say 50% are U.S., 25% are European, uh, maybe 20% Canadian, and the rest uh, from all over the world. Was there any other traditional media you recommended for this online employment marketplace? Or yes, more radio just was radio was huge for them. So they had seen a lot of success with uh, traditional radio in the U.S., and they saw a ton of success with traditional radio in Canada. Because think about it, for this for the employer agency, people are driving home from the office, business owners, they're listening to the radio. What's a better spot to hit them when they're maybe frustrated at work with some employees or they're trying to expand? And it was a great uh, avenue to hit them. And is it, um, I, I don't know, is it called terrestrial radio versus online radio? Is that yeah. is that what they, or were they doing online radio as well? So they would do online radio, a lot of Spotify, and then they would do podcast podcast sponsorships. The problem with a lot of podcast sponsorships for Canada anyways, is there's not that many podcasts that have a big Canadian only audience. The top podcasts in the world, like if you think of like a, a Joe Rogan um, kind of podcast, that's a US based podcast, 90% of the audience is probably from the US. So if you're a Canadian brand trying to sponsor a podcast, you're going to find it challenging to find one that's like a pure Canadian audience. If you can only service Canada, um, if you can service both markets, great. But a lot of brands can only service one or two markets and they don't want to pay that premium uh, to spend impressions on the U.S. when they can't even sell to them. Are you seeing um, an uptick in people using podcasting? I mean, this is for sponsorships or is it's, it still not not I mainstream? I think it's, I definitely have seen an uptick in it. There's there's no doubt uh, that we have seen an uptick. I think that the question that we're having now is really how to measure the performance. Um, we find it really difficult. Since we're a pure performance agency, more or less, 90% of our clients, um, they come to us with a budget and say, I expect X amount of ROI for this investment. And we are like, it, let's go work with Johnson & Johnson again. <laughs> they don't. Yeah, exactly. So like podcasts are built for, more brands and awareness. That is really what they're built for. And I think they'll always be able to serve that because a lot of podcasts are great because they're targeting a really niche audience of people. It's like, okay, I know this type of person is listening to this podcast. And if I serve them an ad, I'm going to engage them. So it's really good for that. I think from a pure performance play, it's still a little bit challenging given the pricing. From a radio ad, it could be the podcast or terrestrial radio. Do you recommend a similar call to action, like a website, or would you differ that based uh, TV versus radio? Yeah, good question. So I think that for radio, what we have seen work would be like an offer code, um, because obviously it's not as visual or it's not visual at all um, when compared to TV. Something that, you know, those jingles, everybody has those jingles, radio stations that they that they listen to as a kid that they still remember and can recite because um, it was such a good jingle that was effective. So I think it's like an offer code or a jingle that really sticks in your mind and is repetitive that you will remember the next time you hear or talk about that brand. And you produce the radio spots too for people? Yes, yeah, so we do. So we actually have a recording studio in our office and that's an, a recording a radio spot. You can get talent script and production for three thousand dollars canadian and we do that you know every month again with advertisers looking to to launch on radio and you can take those spots a lot of podcast buying that that we've done is kind of run a network uh, and it's through programmatic so i'll take that 30 second ad that we're running on radio i'll throw it into the programmatic targeting digital audio and you can use that same spot for digital audio ad inserted podcast what should people consider as a budget for the the podcast uh ads yeah so i think dr weiss for the sponsorships that's like a set you can spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars if you try to sponsor joe rogan's podcast for instance hundreds of thousands of dollars um if you just want to do a digital ad insertion so you know any podcast that just would run like a standard 30 second ad you can test the budget in the 2500 dollar range uh, per week and really target efficiently your demo uh, and see efficiencies. I think that from a media budget uh, makes sense. Interesting. Um, what about there was a, a company you work with, Digital Maturity Group, and what did yes. you do with them? Yeah, so that was a pure B2B play. So currently in Canada, there is a government grant called CDAP. 
So the goal of this CDAP um, grant is to help businesses, like let's just take your uh, traditional real estate agent or mortgage broker. They maybe have a website, but you know it's kind of old school. They don't have the internal capabilities uh, to transition their brand uh, to make it more digitally focused. So that's what the CDAP grant does. You work with an approved CDAP advisor. Kingstar is approved CDAP advisor. There's you know probably 50 other Canadian companies that are approved CDAP advisors. You get a plan written from the CDAP advisor, and the government will give you fifteen thousand dollars to pay the CDAP advisor. You don't have to repay it; it's just a, a grant. They'll write you a plan to fully transition your business to make it more digitally focused. From there, once you get that, then you're um, approved for a up to a hundred thousand dollar loan from the government of Canada with zero interest. So you get the fifteen k for free. They show you how to change your business. And make it more digitally. Should focused. we start a Canadian branch of Rise Twenty Five then, and get that grant, or what? <laughs> what are you do telling it. me here? <laughs> you could do it. Um, so and so, the Digital Maturity Group they were um, they're a company that actually promotes these advisors and helps grow these advisors. And they're looking for companies that are looking to take advantage uh, of this CDAP grant. So they had never been on TV before. We did a TV spot for them. We actually created it in house uh, for a, a very low price. It's actually under fifteen thousand, uh, thirty second spot, and we're running it on uh, Canadian TV currently. And they've been seeing great results. That one has a QR code, and it also has a URL at the bottom. And we've been able to track results from both. It's interesting. Is that more just like people aren't educated? It just seems like a no brainer offer. What what's the object or what are people's objections to to that offer? Well, it exactly, like, it, it is, seems like it, free money. So it's, uh, people honor, think it's too good to be true, or something, and they don't believe it. I think it's twofold. So you're absolutely right. It's uh, a no brainer. If you're a business and you, uh, I think it was, I believe you had to have two hundred fifty thousand revenue in uh, the last one or two years. So it's a you know relatively decent amount. But uh, so many businesses qualify for it. I think they said there's like five hundred thousand Canadian businesses that just based on their revenue would qualify for it. I think the problem is that the Canadian government has done no advertising themselves to promote it. And maybe there's reasons why that they have done that, but there's nobody knows about it. And like you said, maybe it's a little bit complicated and people don't fully understand it. So Digital Maturities Group was trying to raise awareness about this grant and that it's available for Canadians to take access or take advantage of. So let's say I have a Canadian business owner listening to this um, or on. Where, if they're interested in that particular uh, offer, where should we send them? Send them to us. Go to kingstarmedia.com, fill out our contact form. We're approved CDAP advisors. We'll get you that 15K uh, free grant. We'll write the digital plan for you. And then once you have that, you'll be approved for the 100K free business loan. So how does the interest work on that? There's no interest. So, so you could just take it out and invest it in like a CD and just make money off of it? You know, this, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty. Maybe there's stipulations there. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's stipulations of what they can invest. The idea of the of the, of the the loan would be to use it to yeah. actually that plan that the CDAP advisor proposed for you or, you know, do a media buy with Google or with Facebook. You have to use it within some sort of marketing channel. Right. Um, that's the intention. Anyways. I could see people using... Um, so. With them, um, they did TV. What else did they use? Because I can see from a U.S. standpoint, I get all these messages, Jeff, about um, the employee retention credit thing. And it's basically the same, similar concept. So I think there's a lot of these type of offers that are similar to this, that it's kind of just an awareness. And um, so how else did they get exposure for, for this? Yeah, so they they ran they run their own digital channels. You know, they'll run on uh, Meta, Facebook, Insta. Uh, they'll do their paid search, um, and then now they've done uh, television with us. But just your traditional digital channels is was how they were promoting it before. Got it, um, Jeff. Uh, I'm curious lessons from you know. It seems like you've been around the agency space for a long time. Obviously, um, even from from a young age. What are some lessons you learned uh, from your dad? Yes, I think some lessons I learned is patience. He, you know, when I was younger, you know, working there during uh, the summers in between university, I would hear him on the phone because I was sat close to his office. And sometimes these people on the line were screaming. They were so angry and so frustrated. 
And he would uh, be able to remain level-headed. He would never raise his voice and he would always remain very calm. So I think that taught me just, it's not really into agency, it's really any business. You're always going to work with either a client, a colleague, or somebody that their emotions sometimes get the best of them. And they're really going to go on tangents, scream, yell, and say things that they don't really mean. But if you're able to remain calm during those situations, you're you're winning automatically. Uh, one, because you're thinking logically and with thought as opposed to with emotion. So I think that's definitely one thing I, I learned from him. He's very patient uh, and calm, even in sometimes the most stressful moments. It must not have been a Canadian-based company because Canadians are too nice to scream at people. Right? Well, I, exactly. I, exactly. Like a lot of the companies that we work with are from New York. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> they're very hard hitters and they expect a lot. Um, the last question, Jeff, and just thanks for sharing your your journey. I want to uh, encourage people to check out kingstarmedia.com. Um, what are some of your favorite resources, books, um, that, that you've looked at over the years uh, that you've seen uh, your colleagues uh, recommend? Yeah. So I think in terms of resources for me, I know, you know, it sounds hacky, but I, on LinkedIn, I follow a lot of what I would say are like marketing influencers. Um, and there's a couple of really small ones just, you know, located here in Toronto that I follow. There's different podcasts for, for me to be or just marketing in general. Uh, and I'm just really like a consumer of content. Who are some of the LinkedIn people that you yeah, like? So there's there? a there's a, a guy named uh, Sean Hurley. Uh, he's a, you know, we'll call it a pseudo uh, LinkedIn influencer. Uh, he has, you know, a lot of his uh, kind of own content that he'll write uh, and talk about. Um, and then there's a few other ones. Uh, the name's escaping me now, but... I am constantly just bombarded with some content on LinkedIn. I usually spend half an hour a day there uh, kind of cruising, reading new trends. And I always find like that's the best way because people are looking to uh, expose new avenues uh, to improve marketing efficiency. Uh, they're looking for new content and there's a lot of contribution uh, and it's a good community there. So I'm always on LinkedIn uh, to use it. And Chris Chris Walker is another um, C, CEO of Refine Labs. He has his own podcast and he uh, posts a lot on LinkedIn and he's very into B2B sales. Um, and, and he's someone that I, that I follow religiously. Awesome. Any other podcasts that you enjoy? Yeah. Podcasts that I enjoy, you know, I'm, I listen, I listen to music while I work a lot. If I have like a project that I'm, you know, I got one or two hours, I need to, to get it done and I don't want any distractions. I'll put in my headphones and I typically like to listen to house music. So I'll listen to like a TSO or a Don Diablo there's no words. It's just a lot of music and I can really lock in and finish the project that I need to. So those are the podcasts, not really speaking podcasts, but listen to another than that. I'll listen to, to Joe Rogan from, from time to time. Awesome. Jeff, thank you so much. Everyone check out kingstarmedia.com and more episodes of the podcast. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand